Let's take our Bibles and turn to a marvelous scripture uh, from the book of Psalms. And I have no idea what I have done with my glasses. Ben, it's not back there behind you, is it? You know what? They're right here. Praise God. Right in my pocket, but thank you for the offer there. I was going to take you up on it. All right, the book of Psalms, chapter 63. I'd like for you, if, if you have a pen, to pull it out. There's a uh, place in your bulletin for sermon notes. Find that. And I'd like for you to jot down all of the scriptures I'm going to be sharing Today, the sermon is going to be packed with Holy Scripture. So the first one is Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Let us pray. Oh God, speak to us. Your servants are listening. Open your word to our hearts. And open our hearts to your word, for we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the most simple, direct, but powerful statements I have ever heard, def uh, one of the most powerful definitions of prayer that I have ever heard is this. Prayer is a conversation of love between two people who love each other. Prayer is a conversation of love. Prayer is when we hear God telling us that he loves us and when we have the opportunity of responding by telling him how much we love him. You know, I can remember um, a wonderful uh, Scottish divine by the name of Thomas uh, Chalmers. Uh, he said in his uh, one of his writings, you know Chalmers? Sort of? Okay. <laughs> he said, prayer is not preparation for a greater work of God. You know, one might think that prayer is preparation for the work of God. But Chalmers said... <laughs> Prayer is not preparation for a greater work for God. Prayer is the greatest work of God. Can I say that again? Prayer is not a preparation for a greater work of God. Prayer is the greatest work of God. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, said prayer is to enlarge our souls, enlarge our hearts until they are capable of containing God. Well, prayer does begin with preparation and the most significant thing to remember about preparation for prayer 
is this. Prayer begins with God. God is the author of prayer. Any time that we desire to pray, it is because God has placed that desire within us. Prayer begins with God. It's because he wants to love us. And he has created us to love him. Prayer is the language of love. You know, there are so many, so many wonderful prayer promises in Holy Scripture. It's hard uh, to choose between them. But I just want to share some this morning. Uh, I, under the understanding of preparation for prayer, perhaps there is no greater Scripture than Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24. Let's take a look at that. Isaiah 65 and verse 24. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> Before they call, I will answer. Wow. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Now, that stresses the provenience of God. God is always beforehand with us. The old theologians used to talk about the provenient grace of God. That means the grace of God that goes before us. God is always before us. He calls us to himself because he has something great that he wants to give us. Now, take a leap from here over to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, and let's look at verse 11. This is a very familiar but wonderful, wonderful scripture. Some of you may have um, memorized this in a different version, but the New International Version says this, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Wow. Now, most people stop their reading right there. But you ought to continue and read the next couple of verses to capture the, the meaning of, of, of that. Verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will will be found by you. Isn't that good? Oh, I tell you, this is sweeter than honey. And then uh, my father's favorite scripture, and I guess one of mine, I've got lots of favorites, would be the 46th Psalm, Psalm 46 and verse 10, which is real preparation for prayer. It says, be still, be still, and know that I am God. Now, that word be still in the Hebrew means to let go, to leave off, to let up, and know that I am God. You know, prayer is not a gimme game. Prayer is a grace gift. It's not, some, it's not primarily to tell God what we want. Prayer is primarily to give God the sovereignty of our lives. It's to open up the throne of our hearts and to let God reign there. That's what prayer is about. Oh, the psalmist, I think, 
uh, articulated, articulates my faith, I guess, better than I can do in the 42nd chapter of Psalm, of the book of Psalms, 42nd chapter, the first two verses. I mean, once I hear of God's love and forgiveness and care, the psalmist just seems to articulate what I feel. Psalm 42, 1 and 2, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? But you can't stop reading there. Keep going. Look at verse 8. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. But you can't stop there. Look at verse 11. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Here is preparation for prayer. And having been invited into the presence of God, suddenly we are awestruck. We're in awe and wonder at the presence of God, and we're ready for praise. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. That's Psalm 9, verse 1. And then a wonderful thing happens in praise. I want to go back to the very first scripture that I read as my text in Psalm 63, Psalm 63, verse 3 and 4. Because your love is better than life. Some translations say, because your loving kindness is better than life. You remember that song we used to sing years ago? Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands in your name. Isn't that a wonderful song? Oh, I like some of those old tunes. I pulled out one the other day. I got so happy. Uh, Anybody ever remember Pass It On? It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around will warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. (laughs) Oh, those are some great songs. We sang those when I was a youth. Um, But uh, you are better than life, he says. Knowing the Lord for the psalmist was an experience of knowing his loving kindness and it was better, it was better than life. So he could go on to say, thus my lips will bless you. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. Oh, listen, let's talk about praise for a little bit. Praise breaks the bind. Praise enables you to let go. Praise enables you to trust God even through the most difficult of situations. Remember remember last week's sermon? Uh, Habakkuk saying, you know, Though everything fails, yet I will still praise him. Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
You, you don't just praise God when things are going good. You praise him when things are extremely difficult, but you praise him all the way through. You praise him when you're locked in, when you're in a corner, when life has painted you in a corner, when life looks like a cul-de-sac. You praise him. You praise him because then you let go and you're ready to hear him. So the psalmist is walking on a volcano of praise. It just erupted and burst forth in him. He couldn't contain it. That's prayer. That's prayer. But then as our praise reaches its crescendo and there's quiet, it's there in the midst of the quiet that you hear the voice of the Lord. And there's no call. There's no call quite like the one that Bob's going to use tonight when he calls us to pray for revival on the south shore. Second Chronicles, write it down, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh, what a great scripture. You ought to memorize that one. Now, everything else that we ask for in prayer, for other people, and for our nation, listen to this, is dependent upon those of us who know the Lord being cleansed. Being cleansed. Cleansed of our sin. As one man put it, he said, since I got the channel open, the phone from God never stops ringing. The channel is open when we confess our sins, when we confess anything that stands in between us and God and that stands in between each other. You know, I sometimes like to take the scriptures that are in the plural and make them singular, like that scripture over in, write this down, 1 John Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is when the beloved apostle John had to confront the church and he said, If we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow, what a promise. And that word confess there, homologeo, means to speak the same, to say after. We have to listen to God in the conversation for him to plumb into the depths so that we might understand the deeper things that we need to confess. And then once we uh, have the channel opened up through confession of our sins, once we've got the channel cleansed, we, what happens? We feel, we feel a thanksgiving, a thanksgiving that we just cannot contain. And you know something? Thanksgiving in, in Holy Scripture is always directly related to the loving kindness of God. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 100 and says in other places, Psalm 104, write that one down. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Why? Why? Go on to see the next verse. Because the Lord is good. 
His mercy endures forever and His truth to all generations. But it is when we realize that, that we can never, we can never sink so low that the Lord cannot reach us. Down beneath the shame and loss sinks the plummet of the cross. Never yet abyss was found deeper than his love would sound. Amen and amen to that. So we can say then with John in the book of Revelation, write this one down, chapter 1, verses uh, five and six, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Ah. Oh. We praise and we give thanks when we experience forgiveness. But now listen, listen, listen to this. This is so important. God has something to say now. Once you're cleansed, he invites us into into, the, his, into relationship with him deeper and deeper. And so he says to us in James chapter 1 and verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. Oh, my. We need to pause in our prayer time. Pause for a time of inspiration and meditation in response to the offer of the gift of wisdom. You see, we, we, need, we need to allow God to show us how to pray. We need to allow God to show us how to pray for others, how to pray for ourselves, how to pray for guidance, for guidance, and what to commit to him. Then the Lord shows what we can do in the rest of our prayers. I know a man who is always requesting any time anybody asks him, is there anything that uh, I can pray for you? His standard answer is wisdom. Wisdom. I need wisdom. And he's one of the wisest guys in the world. Why? Because he asks God for it. And God gives it generously, liberally, without fault. He gets it. He gets it. Once we got that wisdom, then, then we can turn to intercession. Intercession is praying for others. And we can know that the Spirit will guide us in our prayers. The Spirit will lead us in our prayers. I'll tell you something. The Apostle Paul had it right in Romans chapter 8, you can write this one down too. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Do you, you feel that? But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts 
knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Oh, from the, from the deepest inner depths of our being, the Lord gives us an understanding of what it is that we are to ask for. His Spirit enters into us, and His Spirit knows the mind of God and interprets the mind of God for us. Jesus calls us to a greater work than he did. Yeah? He calls us to be intercessors. Claiming for people what he came to die to provide. We're intercessors. Look at John chapter 14. Let's just get it straight from the horse's mouth. Let's get it straight from the, from the words of Jesus. Listen to this. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. But watch this. He will do even greater things than these. Why? Because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Well, what is that? Go over to the 15th chapter and let's read that verse that, that Brother Bob mentioned in his prayer today. Chapter 15, verse 12. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Intercession is the language of love. And intercession is identification, identifying with the one for whom you're praying. Intercession is identification, and intercession is involvement, and it is pain. That's right. Taking on to ourselves the deepest needs within others, communicating them to God. That's intercession. But the Spirit will lead us in that and help us to know what to pray for. When He shows us what the need is, how wonderful, how wonderful is that? We can pray for what God is more ready to give than we have to ask. And once we've prayed for others, now we're in a position to pray for ourselves. Now, we, this is supplication. Now we can tell God what is in our hearts. I want to give you a... Listen, what I'm giving you this morning is worth more than a million dollars. Psalm 55. Write this one down. Psalm 55 in verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Claim that. Claim that promise. And he will guide you. And back up into... Uh, let me go to one of my favorites. Philippians. Philippians 
chapter 4. Don't be anxious about it. Well, you need, the, you need the references, don't you? Let me just flip over there. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8, or, or rather, I'm sorry, 6. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, that's all inclusive, in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And having given him our concerns, we long to know his will, to know his will in the problems and the decisions that we have to make daily. So, go uh, Psalm 32 and verse 8. Write that one down. Psalm 32 and verse 8. Oh, what a promise. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Another version says, I will counsel you by my eye. Back up to Psalm 31 and verse 3. 31, 3. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know what? Our task is to give God lead time. Lead time. And he will impress upon us, if we do this, he will impress upon us what he wants us to do. You know, rather than going to God just before you have to make a decision, why don't you give it a few days? A few weeks, if you can. And, and ask him to use every experience, the reading of his word, what other people say to you, what happens around you, allow him to speak through all of that. And he will. He will. Well, I'm coming in for a landing here, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you don't know this, but I am expending so much energy up here. No wonder I take a nap in the afternoon. <laughs> and boy, I'm going to need one because I've got to go with round two tonight at the high school. But having done all that we've talked about, we still need further release. <laughs> the next step in prayer is commitment. Commitment. And you know what I found out this week? commitment in the Hebrew comes from a root that means to roll R-O-L-L -L, to roll to roll it off my back and then roll it on to God's back wow that's commitment and you thank him that he has taken what you have committed to him Roll it off your back and let him take it. Now, most of us will just end right there and hang up on God. Before God has the opportunity to provide us with what we most need. And you know what that is? It is the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. That's it empowerment the empowering of the Holy Spirit that's the last step of prayer 
Jesus promised us, and I got to tell you about a dream I had the other night. You know, I really do believe God speaks to me in my dreams, and it's, they're becoming more frequent. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I do know what uh, Peter said in that sermon on the day of Pentecost, he stood up and he quoted Joel 2.28 and said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I dreamed the other night. You know, sometimes my dreams are visual, sometimes they are auditory, but I dreamed that there was a mighty river of living water running through me. It was just constant. It was like an, uh, an artesian well. It just wouldn't stop. And the more it went on, the happier I got, and I felt clean on the inside. And then in my dream, I remembered what Jesus said in the seventh chapter of John. He said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And then what happens? Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him might receive. That was it. It was the Holy Spirit. The rivers of living water. He promises us that that will happen. Listen, he told those disciples in the first of Acts, you wait here. You wait here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And they waited for that power, and you and I must do the same thing. Don't end your prayers. Stay on your knees until you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. Wait for that power so that you can live supernaturally in doing the things that you've prayed for. Whew. Paul in Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that literally reads in the Greek, I can do everything through Christ who keeps on pouring his power into me. <laughs> we can experience that too if we'll pray. So folks, there you have it. I'm calling you to prayer. Pray. Stay on your knees. Revival demands it. Amen, amen. and amen.